Okay. Um, so hi everyone. Today um, we are very honored to uh, host uh, Professor uh, Josh Bongard, um, who has been working on uh, evolutionary robotics, uh, evolutionary computation, and physical simulation. And um, he runs the Morphology Evolution and Cognition Laboratory, where uh, they focus on um, uh, the role that morphology and evolution play in cognition. Uh, he's won uh, prestigious awards, such as Microsoft Research uh, New Faculty Fellowship. Um, and he was actually named one of the MIT's uh, Technology Review's top uh, 35 young innovators on their 35. Uh, and we are very, very excited to um, uh, hear him talk about uh, the, bi the biological robots that they've made. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, an honor uh, to host you here, Josh. Uh, just a couple of communication rules. Um, um, everyone will be muted during the talk and um, you can raise your hand if you have uh, questions. Is that okay, Josh, to um, kind of like have the questions in the middle? Yes, sure. Absolutely, and please just, just interrupt and ask questions. That would be perfectly fine. Great, uh, and let's keep this talk in, uh, interactive. Um, and uh, at the end, you'll have a 10 minute open discussion. Um, and yes, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and let Josh take it away. Great, thank you so much, Kiana. And thanks to all of you for, for attending. Um, it's Friday afternoon here on the East Coast, I guess Friday morning for a lot of you on the West Coast. So uh, uh, thanks, for, thanks for attending. Um, so as promised, I'm gonna speak about um, our biological robotics project. And this is a collaborative effort. Um, it started uh, as a collaboration between myself and Sam Kriegman, uh, who's now a postdoc working with Doug Blackiston and Michael Levin uh, at Tufts. But before I, I talk specifically about biological robotics, I wanted to take a couple steps back and talk about um, where biological robots and embodied AI sits in the larger AI uh, landscape. So in order to talk about the larger AI landscape, I like to use this geometric uh, metaphor. So if you imagine for a moment this one spatial dimension, we'll call it performance, you can imagine uh, points embedded in this line as representing uh, AI artifacts, so trained or less trained neural networks. The further to the right uh, in this dimension the point lies, the more accurate that our AI artifact is at whatever we want it to do. So it has low loss if it's a neural network <clears throat> or high reward if it's, a, if it's an RL agent. Points uh, lying towards the left are, you know, not that much better than a randomly generated neural network or RL agent. You can then think about line segments embedded in the spatial dimension as representing an arbitrary AI training algorithm. And uh, that AI training algorithm is trying to push points from the stem, the left-hand side of its line segment towards points at the right-hand side of its line segment. And as we all know, for the vast majority of, the, of AI history, uh, we weren't able to train neural networks or RL agents that did significantly better than, than random. But thanks to the deep learning revolution and the big data revolution, we can now train neural networks and RL agents in certain circumstances that do as well well, if not better uh, than humans. The current state of play in AI that most of us are kind of interested in is generality. So we can train, uh, we can we can train accurate specialists, but producing accurate or high performing generalists is still uh, an open problem. So in order to think about that, we can add this second spatial dimension, which I'll call tasks or generality on the vertical axis. And a single point embedded in this now two-dimensional space still represents an AI artifact. But the height of that point represents how many training environments or how many domains we've exposed that AI artifact to. And its horizontal position represents the mean ability uh, of that AI artifact at all of the, uh, at its current task or domain and the previous tasks or domains that we've trained it on. 
If you then think about training algorithms that are exposing uh, neural networks or, or, or RL agents to more and more tasks, the line segment typically looks like this because of catastrophic forgetting. We can usually start out in the bottom right by quickly training an accurate uh, low loss specialist. But as we expose that specialist to more and more tasks, it gets worse and worse at previous uh, tasks. A lot of people are making uh, improvement on catastrophic interference is just sort of give you a sense of how this metaphor works. Some AI researchers argue with just some more algorithmic innovation and more data and more compute, we'll eventually be able to approach something like AGI. We'll eventually have uh, something that becomes increasingly accurate and increasingly general, no matter how many tasks we throw at it. However, uh, again, there are reasons to be cautious. Um, here's an example of some state-of-the-art AI, GPT-3, which is excellent on average at answering human queries, um, but it's not that difficult if you, if you know your AI and you know your GPT-3, it's not that difficult to hone in on questions that will quickly expose GPT-3 as uh, someone or something that cannot pass the Turing test. I don't mean to beat up unfairly on GPT-3, but just to illustrate that even our state-of-the-art AI, as probably most of you know, are still uh, vulnerable to antagonistic attack. It's interesting to take a GPT-3 and compare it uh, to arguably the very first chatbot, Eliza, from the late 60s. Um, I found an Eliza bot online this morning, and I posed the exact same five questions to Eliza, um, as you see on the right here. And I would argue that Eliza actually did a little bit better than GPT-3. Eliza was elusive, um, rather than exposing uh, her ignorance. Again, this is meant to be a little bit tongue in cheek, but as, as most of us know, the worst case performance for most state of the art is still horrendous. What is missing? You ask any AI researcher what's missing and they'll obviously tell you it's the algorithm that they're working on, which is gonna solve everything. Um, but there's quite a bit of consensus out there in the field that what's missing is this idea of common sense, right? GPT doesn't know that it made a mistake um, and so it's sort of, it's not just, it's not just ignorant or lacking the answer, it's actually lacking common sense altogether. One of the things that, that I love about robotics and AI is it challenges us to sharpen our understanding of what we even mean by cognitive abilities like common sense. If you ask someone what, if you ask an AI researcher what common sense is, they'll probably tell you, well, I don't know how to formally define it, but I know it when I see it. It's a common refrain you hear in AI all the time. One way to come at common sense is to think about common sense among humans, and definitely not all humans uh, exhibit common sense all the time, but what is common among humans that allow at least some of us to learn and practice common sense most of the time? It's not our language, it's not our culture. There's great cultural diversity, language diversity. We, we all grew up in very different physical and cultural environments. One thing that is common across humans is our physiology. And again, humans differ in terms of physiology as well. Some of us are differentially, uh, are physically advantaged and disadvantaged in different ways, but there is a fair bit of commonality in our physiology, which AI and roboticists refer to as embodiment. So continuing this geometrical metaphor, let's add a third dimension, with, which pushes now from the front of this cube towards the back of the cube, and we'll label this third dimension embodiment. Again, you can now uh, think of any point in this space as a more or less embodied AI artifact. So points in the front of this cube are non-embodied agents like neural networks or RL agents. And as we push, uh, as we look at points further and further towards the back of the cube, they're becoming more and more embodied. Like common sense, uh, I don't have a formal definition for embodiment, but for today, we'll just assume that this is a, an agent that has more uh, motors and sensors and is able to push on the world in a more diverse set of ways and observe the sensory repercussions of those actions in lots of different ways. So more diverse ways to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. And that feedback loop, that motor sensor feedback loop, not 
sensor motor, motor sensor, I act and observe the sensory repercussions of that action. I would argue is the raw material for also pushing up and to the right. A lot of people working in embodied AI these days, um, but not all ways of approaching embodied AI are always successful. So if one of the things that humans share in common is a human body plan, then why don't we make humanoid robots and start, uh, so we're starting towards the back of the cube here. We have something that has a very complex embodiment, lots of motors and sensors, but maybe we start with a, a tabula rasa. We start with a, con a random control policy, which means we have no performance. So we're to the left of this cube and it's still a specialist. This robot doesn't know how to do anything yet. So it is also at Y equals zero. So uh, a lot of the entrants in the DARPA robotics challenge, for example, were starting more or less at the left uh, lowest back point of the cube. And again, I don't mean to pick on the, the DARPA uh, Grand Challenge entrance. There were some amazing uh, successes there. Again, this is just pointing out a few of the rare failures in the DARPA Grand Challenge. Uh, approach. But again, even just my, my point, the point that I wanted to make here is that just taking into account embodiment is not often sufficient. There are other points in this three-dimensional space where we can start if we're interested in embodied AI, like for example, starting at zero, zero, zero. So starting with uh, AI artifacts, artifacts that are minimally embodied, they have very, very simple bodies. They cannot do anything yet, and they, are, they cannot do anything general yet. We can then imagine AI algorithms, and these are the ones that we try and work on in my group, which more or less follow the grand diagonal. They're pushing from 0, 0, 0, the front left bottom part of the cube, towards the back right upper point of the cube. Meaning that as training proceeds, we are not just improving the control policy for a robot and gradually exposing it to more environments or more domains or more tasks, but we are also allowing the training algorithm to complexify the morphology of the robot as well. I mentioned a minute ago that one of the things that all humans share in common is a, uh, is a human body plan. And that often leads us to think about the end point of our development, which is the adult human form. The other thing that all humans have in common that we also share with plants and animals is development. We all start with one cell and complexify into multicellular organisms. That is often uh, under, I would say, undervalued or underexplored in embodied AI not trying to replicate the form of humans or animals, but to replicate the developmental, and in some cases, the ev evolutionary trajectory in which body plan and control policy complexify over time. And that's what evolutionary robotics is all about. Instead of trying to replicate the, uh, the product of evolution, like a human or a dog, Evolutionary robotics tries to replicate the process of evolution, to create evolutionary algorithms that work on machines that change their body along with their control policies. And when you do that, when you try and follow this grand diagonal, it opens up new kinds of uh, new questions, new hypotheses, new ways of approaching quote unquote AGI. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about that in the context of uh, biobots in a moment, but this is also possible in non-biological robotics. This is a common example that's shown in embodied AI, uh, which is uh, Cornell's passive dynamic walker. It has minimal morphological complexity. It's mechanically pretty simple, and it has zero sensors and zero motors. It's very much a specialist, so it's very low down in that cube I just showed you, but it's pretty performant. It does a very good job at energy efficient walking in a very narrow environmental envelope, which is a slightly declined plane. The interesting thing, the, the continuing thing that's interesting about the passive dynamic walker, which has been around for decades now, is it's a, an appealing starting point for thinking about robotics. It's a very different starting point than the Atlas humanoid 
robot? How can we start here and move towards machines that are more general purpose, more complex and more performant? Uh, Rolf Pfeiffer and I talk about the passive dynamic walker uh, quite a bit in a popular science book we co-authored a number of years ago now. The book is somewhat outdated, um, but we do go through some of the, the philosophy and the history of this idea of embodied cognition, which predates robotics. It comes from philosophy and psychology. And again, it gives us sort of lots of tools for thinking about how to approach robotics and AI uh, differently. So if the passive dynamic walker starts with a very simple body plan and no control policy whatsoever, so does the Xenobot. So um, I'm gonna use the term Xenobot, which is the, the nickname that these machines were given by the popular press when we published this work back in 2020. Uh, a Xenobot is a portmanteau of uh, Xenopus lavis, uh, the African clawed frog. Um, the Xenobot that you see in the bottom half here uh, is made from about 2,000 cells taken from Xenopus lavis. Uh, it is moving based on cardiac tissue, which increases and decreases in volume and acts like the actuator system for this. So it's not a passive uh, walker. It is active. But like the passive dynamic walker, it is a machine that's relatively simple from a morphological point of view, just 2,000 cells. And I'll talk about more details of this in a moment, and has no obvious control policy. So again, for us, xenobots are an interesting starting point for thinking about how to move from xenobots towards more complicated or interesting uh, biological machines, or even biohybrid machines, robots made up of artificial and biological uh, components. Um, so just for reference, a xenobot here, as I mentioned, is about 2,000 cells, and so it's about one millimeter. It's just barely visible with the naked eye. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit more specifically now about biological robots, and then we'll uh, talk about its implications. Um, again, I, I hope this is an interactive talk. I'll just pause for a moment in case there's any questions or comments. So far, so good? Okay. Okay, so as mentioned, we're starting with uh, Xenopus lavis, and um, the, the history of this project was started through a, a funding, a collaborative funding project between my group and Mike Levin's group uh, at Tufts University. Um, the Levin lab has been working with lots of different model organisms for a number of years and studying developmental plasticity. The fact that it's not just plants that change how they grow in response to the environment, but animals do as well. And that's not always so obvious to us. There's sort of this intuition that animals and humans, we grow into a fixed adult form and the environment we experience along the way as we develop has little to no influence on uh, how we physically grow. Mike's group has shown that that's not the case. Um, I don't have time to go into the details of this, but there's a fascinating study they published back in 2013 where they took a Xenopus lavis uh, tadpole and they surgically implanted um, eye progenitor cells. So these are cells that are destined to become an eye, a frog eye. They embedded that in the tail of the tadpole. And not only did that surgical implantation not kill the tadpole, but the tadpole, as it grew into an adult frog, those eye progenitor cells developed into a functioning eye on the back of the frog. And that eye sent out neural connections and uh, uh, established a neural handshake with uh, the spinal cord, of the uh, frog so that the adult frog could actually use the third eye on its back for phototaxis, navigating and moving towards a light source. So that work from 2013 suggested not only that animals are open to suggestion during development, meaning you can deflect through the environment, a developing organism to develop into something you don't see in the wild, like a three-eyed frog, it suggested that you can actually add new function in or a completely different function along the way. So that finding was the starting point for our collaboration where we then asked the question, could you create an AI algorithm that searches the space of all possible developmental deflections to try and find those developmental deflections that would push early frog embryo into a completely different form and some desired function. And that was the beginning of the xenobots. 
The way we did that is to isolate um, uh, the, the material that we were going to use. So instead of uh, surgically implanting an eye or something into a developing embryo, we would harvest cells from early uh, frog embryo. And we harvested two cell types. The first one was uh, uh, skin stem cells. So these are stem cells that are destined to become a certain type uh, of skin cell. And we also uh, extracted uh, myocardiocytes, so heart muscle cells. Um, frog heart muscle cells, if they arrange themselves during development into the shape of a frog heart, that particular configuration of myocardiocytes will cause them to synchronize, which is what you want, so that they all contract and expand at the same time and increase and decrease the internal volume of a heart, which allows a heart to act as a pump. That's what you want. Um, we asked Doug Blackiston, who was the microsurgeon who was extracting these myocardiocytes, what happens if we rearrange myocardiocytes into some arbitrary blob of heart tissue what will the cells do? Will they synchronize? Will they increase or decrease in frequency or amplitude? And the answer was, we don't know. So we built that in to our model that I'll show you in a moment as a bit of uncertainty. Um, we then took, uh, we took the uh, VoxCAD simulator, which was originally created in Hod Lipson's lab uh, at, uh, at Cornell, which as you can see on the left here is a soft bodied uh, physics engine. Um, my group has now created a version of VoxCAD called VoxCraft, uh, which runs on GPUs. Um, if you Google that, there's a tutorial page. You can try out uh, VoxCraft on Google Colab and uh, get a sense for how this physics engine uh, works. But I think the, the movies are more than sufficient. You can see how this works. It takes a finite element approach where we simulate an arbitrary uh, soft object as a collection of small 3D pixels or voxels. And we can assign to each individual voxel different material properties. Um, when Hod's group originally did this, it was to simulate soft robots, but we're gonna use it to simulate biological robots, where now the voxels are going to represent uh, are gonna represent not an individual cell. So we don't have voxel to cell resolution. We're gonna assume that each voxel represents about, uh, about several hundred cells. So a small pass, patch of tissue. Our microsurgeon colleague, Doug, told us that he can take skin and cardio, cardiomyocytes and rearrange them at about that resolution when building uh, what would become a xenobot. We gave that information to uh, our AI, which is simply an evolutionary algorithm wrapped around uh, the VoxCraft simulator. So evolutionary algorithms have been around since the 1960s, not a very complicated AI algorithm, arguably probably the simplest one. Um, as you can see in this picture here, an evolutionary algorithm starts with a random collection of solutions. Um, so in this case, it's, uh, we use uh, compositional pattern producing networks or CPPNs. CPPNs are a type of generative network, which in this case generate or place voxels at locations and paint different material properties onto those voxels. So what I'm showing you here are the three things that were generated by three separate CPPN generative networks. The fitness function here is simply displacement away from the origin. And you can see that not, none of these three do a very good job of that, which again is not surprising at the beginning. I mentioned that um, there's a fair bit of uncertainty about what happens when you put together arbitrary uh, collections of frog myocardiocytes. Uh, in the simulation, we assume that myocardiocytes are these red-green voxels that increase and decrease in volume, and they're doing so at more or less the same frequency. So there was an understanding that they probably have about the same frequency and the same amplitude, but they would not necessarily synchronize. They might, they might not. So we made a conservative estimate, which is that in every simulation, no matter where cardiomyocytes are placed, they, are all, they all have random phase offsets from one another. This makes for a very non-intuitive design exercise. Um, one way to think about this is if you were asked to create the shape, uh, design a boat, and in that boat you can put as many human rowers as you want, um, and the only stipulation is that those rowers are not going to synchronize. So you're trying to build a boat 
the geometry of a boat and placement of rowers so that that boat moves as straight as possible, as quickly as possible. You're trying to build a reliable machine out of unreliable parts. It's a diffi very difficult design problem, which is exactly what evolutionary algorithms are designed, uh, are designed to do. Okay. After running this uh, on our GPU cluster here at Vermont for a couple of days, uh, we finally got back the design that you see in the top here. Um, some of you may have seen this before. It doesn't move very quickly, but even with randomly acting pistons or simulated uh, myocardiocytes, you get more or less straight travel from left to right. You'll notice that the evolutionary algorithm is hit on some interesting design heuristics here. Um, all of the actuation is on the ventral or the lower surface, and the skins and it's placed skin cells on the on the top surface of this robot. One of the things that the skin cells are doing is, aside from providing support or sort of the overall structure of the robot, they are passively absorbing absorbing force from the randomly actuating uh, ventral pieces. One of the hypotheses we have, but we haven't really tested this well yet, is that what the evolutionary algorithm is doing is finding body plans that de-randomizes uh, some of the random actions of the components and channels that into less random or more reliable global action. Kiana, I think maybe you had your hand up first. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, a couple of questions. Uh, do you, um, what, what kind of physical forces from outside do you have here? Um, and do you have gravity? And if you have gravity, how, um, how do you manage the uh, weights? And um, is, is that something that you took into account? Yep, so uh, there is uh, gravitational forces here. There is also uh, static and dynamic friction between the robot and the floor. There's no self collisions. So you don't see it so much in these robots, I don't think, but uh, it doesn't resolve self collisions, which is a little bit uh, inaccurate. Um, although this is drawn with voxels, each voxel has an internal point and it's just a point mass system. So uh, the evolutionary algorithm is able to distribute or play with mass distribution by distributing these point masses around the, the body. Another question there, another hand up. Yes, uh, so I have, I have a few questions. So one is, is, is the objective only moving straight or do you have other objectives as well? Well, yeah, I will show you some other objectives. We started with straight movement. This, this is usually what we always start with because the, the more difficult thing is not evolving locomotion, it's crossing the sim to real gap. So does this design transfer to reality? And the reason I'm showing it to you is this is one of the few that did. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the sim to real challenges, and then I'll show you some of the other uh, behaviors we evolved for the Xenobots. I see. And what is the what does the changing color mean? Like the, these oh. green green boxes that like, change uh, between. Uh, I mean, they 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 have like different colors. What what does that mean? Yeah, it's just it's it's a little difficult to see here. So green is when a voxel is increasing in volume, and red is when it's decreasing in in volume. And the reason we tied color to volume change is so that you could see this random phase offset. You can you can see the random action of the quote unquote actuators. And if you kind of watch the trajectory here, it's a it's less it's more or less straight. I'll show you some actual trajectories in a in a moment. All right, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions before I push on? Okay. So again, not too much innovative here on the on the evolutionary algorithm side. Um, the the biggest challenge here, as is often the case in robotics, is crossing the simulation to reality gap. So we took this particular design and we sent it to uh, Doug, our microsurgeon at Tufts, and Doug set to work actually trying to construct this design from frog tissue. And there's dozens of videos showing this process. So I just picked a few um, along the way showing you how this works. So you're looking down through the microscope with uh, Doug. And what you're looking at here with these spheres, these are very, very early frog embryos. And what you're gonna watch at the beginning here is Doug is gonna first uh, remove what's called the animal cap. 
So this is the top part of, uh, of a cell uh, of an early embryo, which exists in all higher animals. And that's the part of the early embryo that's gonna develop into the actual animal. Uh, everything else is sort of food and, and other things. So he's taking off this particular piece of the embryo that contains the animal cap. And the animal cap contains the stem cells that Doug is interested in which is skin stem cells that are going to turn into skin and uh, cardiomyocytes, which are going to develop into uh, muscle tissue. Once he's removed this animal cap, so you can see actually now two animal caps in this picture here. Um, he's now removing the ectoderm, so the inner part of, uh, of these animal caps. And the dark material you see is the, um, uh, sorry, the ectoderm is the dark material. So that's the outer piece of skin that he doesn't want. He's going for the dissociated inner cells. So those very small white uh, spheres that you see, those are individual frog stem cells. Um, most of which are uh, uh, skin stem cells. So he's sort of harvesting the raw material that he's going to use to build the xenobots. Once he's removed all of these, uh, once, once he's uh, got a, a pure collection of these uh, skin cells, he pulls them up into a syringe and he's now gonna uh, extract these or push them down into the bottom of a Petri dish. And that dark circle that you see is a little concave well. So those cells are going to settle into that dish. And I don't think you can see it in this video. I think you can see it in the next video. Yep. Um, all, all, all cells don't like to be on their own. So you'll notice that they're starting to draw together again. So these, st these skin cells are adhesive, they're a little sticky. So they're trying to connect together. And um, Mike kind of refers to this as rebooting multicellularity. So we've actually sort of thrown away the default developmental trajectory. We've collected a small fraction of the embryo. We've got just these cells. They're in a completely different developmental environment than they've ever been in before. Their neighbors at the moment are completely different from what their neighbors normally would be in normal development. So in the absence of this, in, in this very strange environment, the cells do what their default behavior is, which is to grab onto their neighbors and pull inward. And so you get this gradually compacting mass of, in this case, just skin cells. Once Doug has this ball of skin cells here, um, the first thing he did when we first started this project was not to make a, a xenobot, but to make a xenosculpture. So what he did was to take, he, he saw one of our simulations of these simulated robots before we started this project. And he started to, as you can see here, burn away some of the material with a micro cauterization tool. So it's like a very small cigarette lighter. And he's got his, uh, his, um, uh, his other micro tools here. So he's sort of acting like a sculpture, a sculptor and removing the unwanted material. And if I jump ahead in this video a little bit, you'll notice he's making these crosswise score marks uh, in the robot, which are going to become, which are going to become the four legs of this quadrupedal robot. So uh, if he takes this and flips it over and it sort of quote unquote stands on the bottom of the Petri dish, he's got a sculpture of a quadrupedal, of a quadruped. Obviously it doesn't move because it doesn't have any uh, myocardiocytes in it. So I'm just gonna back up a couple of steps here. So in order to add in, uh, in order to add in the myocardiocytes, what Doug would do is again using the, uh, by in, it would be to inject a small amount of skin cells into this well and the skin cells settle into the well. And then he would inject some myocardiocytes which would settle on top. And then more skin, more muscle, more skin, more muscle. So it's like building up a sandwich. So we can get sort of two dimensional layers of skin and heart muscle tissue. And if you look at this particular evolved design, this design was manufacturable because there's a clear lower layer of 
uh, heart muscle tissue and a clear upper layer of skin tissue. If you have arbitrary columns of skin and uh, muscle, that would not be manufacturable by Doug at the moment. Yes, Kiana. First of all, mind blown. Um, so um, I have a couple of questions. Um, sure. So, so these cells, okay, this, this might be a very stupid question, but it's coming from a person from computer science background. The last biology course I took was years ago. Um, so these, these cells, um, when you put them in this hole, they're not alive, right? Good question. So whether or not this is an organism is a tricky question, but the cells are very much alive. So at the cellular level, they are definitely alive. Um, each, for example, each of these frog cells comes quote unquote preloaded with yolk material, like literally egg yolk. So they each cell has its own battery. It is digesting the yolk inside the cell, turning that AT into ATP, which becomes usable energy. And that drives all of the cellular functions including cellular communication. So talking to your neighbors, um, cells have sensors and actuators of their own. They know when they're in contact with neighboring cells and, they, and cells can actively deform their surface so they can pull and push or, and deform their curvature. And that's what I mean by pulling, pulling their neighbors in towards themselves. So at the cellular, the cells are alive, whether this 2000, this collection of 2000 cells is an organism that's alive, that's a much more difficult philosophical question. Um, they're alive for about seven days. So the, this particular species of frog cells, when left to their own devices, they will use up all of their yolk within about seven days. They stop moving and they, they rot away and that's it. And you have just organic matter that's indistinguishable from from other flora and fauna. Um, that, that reminds me of another point. This is genetically unmodified frog cells. So this is not genetic engineering. This is morphological engineering, rearranging tissue and trying to push this thing along different developmental trajectories. Okay. Great, great um, question. And then, um, so you were saying that um, he'll put the uh, skin cells and then on top of it, um, the cells that are moving. So if I want to look at the, um, the uh, organism on the left, it will be a like a combination of these robots on top of each other, right? Because we have this kind of a layer by layer sandwich. So then we have a skin layer, a moving layer, skin layer, moving layer. Then this means each one of these things is composed of a couple of the ones in silico on the left. Uh, no, each individual, each individual one on the left here. So this one, for example, is what is what he could build. So he would build just one of these. The three that I'm showing in the very left-hand column, those are the initial random xenobots uh, generated by the evolutionary algorithm. And this one you're seeing in the middle column here, this was the fastest moving simulated xenobot at the end of the evolutionary algorithm. So that was the candidate design that we sent to Tufts to build. I see. So maybe my understanding of the one in the middle is not right. Because to me, it seems like it's a skin la layer and then on top of it is just the moving ones. But maybe yep. you have something, right? So let me, let me just, yeah. So, uh, so here on the lower surface, the, these red green ones, this is cardiomyocytes. So when Doug is building this xenobot, he would inject myocardiocytes as the lower level, the first layer in the concave well. And then this upper surface, the, these blue voxels are meant to represent skin cells and he would inject a layer on top. So muscle and skin on top. Got it, got it. If you had, if you had a xenobot that was a 3D checkerboard, meaning muscle skin, muscle skin, muscle skin, muscle skin, muscle skin, muscle skin. That's not currently manufacturable. So th this is something that's often, um, often missed in sim to real is that if we're not supposing the physical form of the robot, like if we don't have a humanoid already, 
we, there's actually two, there's actually two barriers we need to get over in sim to real. The first one is, is a simulated design manufacturable? And in this project, that was about less than half or maybe one in 10 were manufacturable. Second question is even if it's manufacturable, even if Doug, the microsurgeon can make this design out of frog tissues, will that physical Xenobot do what the simulated Xenobot did in the virtual environment? So there's actually two hurdles to get over and both are sort of open research questions. Lots of interesting questions to ask there. Okay. Of course, the reason I'm showing you this particular Xenobot is it was manufacturable and it moves more or less in the way that the evolutionary algorithm pr uh, predicted it would. So what you're looking at now in the bottom half of this video, we're actually looking at sort of this Xenobot from above and you'll notice that it's rocking sort of side to side. And that's being caused by the, that's being caused by the myocardiocytes that are underneath. And the top surface that we're looking at here, this is skin cells. So the myocardiocytes and the skin cells don't show up as different colors in the physical xenobot. But I think you, you get the idea. The, the shape is not perfect and the behavior is not perfect, but close enough. This, this physical xenobot moves faster or moves further from the origin than any other randomly constructed physical xenobot. So we've sort of crossed the sim to real gap for forward locomotion. Okay, Okay. Um, there was a question about what else can we get these Xenobots to do? So the first stage uh, that we published on was just showing that you can cross the simulation, the reality gap. Um, then we started to have some fun and we asked questions of what would happen if you built the exact same design and put multiple instances of that bot in an environment? And in addition, what would happen if we sprinkle some smaller objects in the dish and in the top left, you'll see something kind of interesting, which is because of the 3D shape of these Xenobots, when they happen to bump into one another, they happen to sort of lock together or get jammed together for a while. And in some cases rotate about their common center of mass and then they move apart again. So there's no programming, there's no sensor motor coordination here, at least not that we have any control over, but you get this kind of interesting swarming behavior. And we saw that same behavior with the physical Xenobots. This is definitely not successful sim to real. So the evolutionary algorithm doesn't predict this behavior and it shows up, but at a very high level, it sort of suggests we might in future be able to evolve interesting uh, collective behavior. Uh, we got some pretty pictures out of this. So th these are uh, small red carmine glass beads. Uh, and you can see that uh, just through random action, they tend to push these beads into, into piles. So that kind of suggested to us, you know, future applications of cleaning up microplastics uh, in our ocean. And we'll see, we'll see. Applications are still a few years out, but, but interesting to think about. Yes, Kiana. Yeah, sorry for asking so many questions. Oh, no this problem. topic is just very interesting. Um, so. Uh, you mentioned that you're not taking the self-collision into account. Um, how, how did you see this um, uh, affecting the seem to real gap basically? Like what were the things that you observed that happened because of this self-collision actually happens in real life, but you weren't taking that as parameter into um, simulation? Yep. It's a good question. And this is also something that's important to know about in sim to real is when you're doing sim to real, the knee jerk reaction is to build, build in as much physical realism to the simulator as you can, hoping that it's enough to cross the gap. But it turns out that whatever, your, whatever physical instantiation you have in mind, often that instantiation is not going to exploit or even uh, be exposed to all of those physical phenomena. For example, in the case of the xenobots, as I mentioned, the cells like to like, they, they like to try and connect together. So, um, so this is like spherification. During the construction of a physical xenobot and even at somewhat after it's built, it tries to pull together back into a sphere of spheres. So it's very difficult to make big physical indentations in the surface of the bot. So it's very hard to make arms and legs. 
We can make sort of little stubby legs like you saw here. But if you're mostly a ball with small stubby appendages, you're not likely to collide with yourself. So that particular physical detail is irrelevant. We can leave that out. Um, because they're small enough and slow enough, they, uh, well, we're not sure, but most of the time it's laminar flow. So there isn't complex fluid dynamics going on around the robot, at least not enough to like influence how it moves. So we can also safely ignore, at least for now, you know, complex aerodynamics or hydrodynamic simulation. It will matter as we move forward, but this is important to think about what your, what your embodied AI is capable of and what it's not capable of. And it's only that subset of physical phenomenon you need to incorporate into the simulation. If you do, uh, if you throw out your physics engine altogether and you train a neural network to approximate the physics of whatever your system is, by definition, the physical system is going to uh, is going to generate training data for you, which is which impinges on a subset of the physics available to that physical machine, which is good news. That's all you need to train your neural network on. So this is part. Of, I think people are often overly pessimistic about sim to real. It's not as hard as it often looks if you think carefully about embodiment. What is the body pot capable of, and what? subset of physical phenomenon is it vulnerable to? Okay, just a detail about sim to real to think about. Um, another thing we evolved uh, the robot to do is we put a small object in the environment and evolved object pushing and we got the robot that you see in the top. This was not manufacturable, but we noticed that one physical Xenobot which was made to locomote just by chance, it happens to bump into this small uh, particle. And you'll notice when it does, it starts circling it. And the probability that it's circling it um, without actually sensing it or being aware of that particle is extremely low. The chance that this just happened by chance is very low. So it suggests that somehow the cells that make up this particular xenobot are quote unquote seeing and responding to this object. And this is another thing that's really interesting about, uh, uh, oops, sorry, that's really interesting about uh, biological robots as com compared to traditional robots is when you build biological robots, the parts that make up the biological robot are themselves robots. They're cells that have their own sensor actuator complements. When we build traditional robots, you're building it out of metals and ceramics. And metals on their own and ceramics on their own have no intelligence. They're dumb materials. So we often get this hidden functionality for free. And that's kind of, kind of changed the thinking in my lab when it comes to evolution, evolving biological robots. It's not evolving them to put function in, but to exaggerate or uh, deflect functionality that's already there. And this is a very different way of thinking about robotics. Um, Mike is fond of, Mike Levin is fond of talking about the xenobots as bots made of bots made of bots, because cells themselves have sub subcellular assemblies, which are also intelligent machines. Um, and so it's interesting to think about embodied AI from that point of view. This was another interesting one. Um, in this case, we did have, uh, we had very simple hydrodynamics turned on and we were evolving for forward locomotion. And one way to move efficiently through a fluid is to be hollow. So we got a hollow Xenobot and Sam, my postdoc, just put this yellow cube inside just for fun. And you get this sort of object transport, which suggested to us again, possible uh, medical applications um, like intelligent drug delivery. Again, these applications are several years off, but kind of an interesting thing to, uh, to think about. Um, last thing I wanna mention, and then I'm, ha I'm happy to take more questions if there are any, which is this idea of, again, not trying to program behavior into uh, a dumb machine, but sort of uh, exploit capability that's already there. Um, here's a Xenobot on the right here. And what you'll notice in a moment is that Doug uh, is gonna reach in and cut the Xenobot almost in half. 
And after the Xenobot experiences this grievous injury, after a few hours, it gradually heals itself back up again. So there's no nervous system here. There's no pain receptors. It doesn't quote unquote know that it's been injured, but the cells themselves, they have what, whatever language cells use to communicate with one another, that language is still intact. The cells are able to communicate to one another that they've been injured. They're able to communicate to their neighbors and their neighbors, 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 and somehow recruit collective action to recover the original form of the, the Xenobot. So although we've completely derailed the frog development, we have not at all, well, not at all, there's still a lot of cellular function that is, that is intact that we can use as raw material. So when I was a postdoc in Hod Lipson's uh, lab, we were, we were fond of pulling legs off of robots and arguing that they could sort of recover in, in some situations, um, but you kind of get that for free with organisms and that's something again that we can, we can exploit. It's very difficult to make a machine that fixes itself after unexpected injury. You get that for free from biological uh, robots. Um, I'll, I'll put a, I'll, I'll end with the link to the Voxcraft slide. I just wanted to make a few final comments before we open it up for questions. Um, what I've shown you so far is evolving biological robots for simple sensor motor tasks, locomotion, pushing an object. It would be interesting to, one of the things we'd like to do moving forward is to use Xenobots to better understand cellular communication. So what are these cells saying to one another as they try and recover from injury. We could, for example, change the fitness function from locomotion to uh, conceptual transparency. What I mean by that is designing a Xenobot so that as it does its thing, like recovering from damage, it is easy for us from the outside to observe cellular communication better than we can in an organism. So, if you injure an organism and try and observe the cells or the tissues trying to recover from that injury, it's very difficult to do from a distance. You can observe, uh, you can observe from in situ inside the organism, but if you do, you usually kill the organism. It's very difficult for a functioning organism to advertise its internal function. Could we design a brand new type of xenobot, a brand new type of organism that is, has the, a particular shape and, and behavior that it can show us how it's recovering when it's recovering or how it does what it does. And this is, I think from a purely scientific point of view, one of the things we're most excited about um, moving forward. One last thing I wanted to mention is in this project, we've been using an evolutionary algorithm, which as most of you know, is an extremely sample inefficient search method. Um, the reason why we and others have been using this for decades to design robot bodies is it's very difficult to follow gradients when you produce a less than optimal body plan. So in the same way that in back propagation of air, you can identify in a classification task local air and follow that back to change synaptic weights. If you design a xenobot and it heals slower than an than another xenobot does. It's very difficult to pinpoint which part in the body is wrong. So in other words, where do you propagate error from? Where do you, how do you propagate morphological error backward to follow gradients towards better and better shapes and better and better tissue distributions? Um, we're making progress on that at the moment. Um, in just the last few years, uh, several authors have published uh, differentiable physics engines. So it's possible to follow physical gradients through a physical uh, simulator, which suggests we might be able to also follow morphological gradients through a physics engine, which is trying to alter or optimize the actual mass and shape and, and tissue distribution in a biological robot. So it's possible we might be able to do all of this in uh, putting it on a more uh, firm machine learning foundation and do this in a gradient based manner. I think there's a lot of interesting, uh, there's a lot of work, interesting work that we could do at that point of intersection. Okay, um, we've got five minutes left. I'll just leave this up here and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, let's let's take questions from the audience first. 
Luca. Uh, so really uh, amazing line of work and a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for uh, coming today. Um, so one question or sort of two questions, um, sort of if we wanna make this sort of technology more uh, actualizable or something that we can put into practice, uh, what are the directions that we need to take to make this more automated? Can we 3D print in the future these types of xenobots and sort of along that line, how long do these xenobots live and how do we um, sort of give them nutrients and, and these kinds of things? Yeah, yeah, great question. So I, you hit the nail on the head. The first thing we need to do is automate manufacture. So design is automated, but it takes Doug several hours to make a single uh, xenobot, not a very scalable solution. So we've we've got uh, we've got some funding lines uh, in the works to do exactly that. So it it probably won't be bioprinters, but it'll be a combination of bioprinting and and organ on a chip and some of these other deposition methods to be able to to scale this up. Um, the other thing um, we're also trying to bring in is uh, a robot scientist. So you know automatically collect observations of physical xenobots about what worked and what didn't work, and back that into the simulator. Um, so really just trying to close the loop. Um, you mentioned how long they live, which is about seven days. Um, so another interesting question is what kinds of body plans could, could the evolutionary algorithm discover that would extend the lifetime? Um, at this scale, at the submillimeter scale, it's mostly a uh, metabolic question. So getting oxygen in and carbon dioxide uh, out. Once you make uh, an artificial or a natural organism that has more than a millimeter uh, radius, you need to get air in and out. And um, so we've actually been, we had a public publication a few weeks ago at RoboSoft about fractal robots. So you can imagine creating body plans that have fractal arrangements of uh, hollow structures, and that might be a way to uh, better aerate a xenobot and start to build uh, larger than millimeter scale xenobots. But again, for the future. Thanks for your question. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan. Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation. This was uh, incredible. Like, I, I've, uh, this was amazing, literally mind blown. Uh, so my question was, um, have you guys thought or, or, or tried to or are thinking of using uh, cells from a different organism? Like I understand the fraud was because, you know, it, it was proven that it could grow that third eye. Um, but uh, I'm pretty sure there's other organisms that maybe have a better, you know, generative capabilities or, or something like that. So are you guys planning on using different cells? Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, different species and different cell types. So basically building up this, this building, this, uh, the types of building blocks that we have available. Um, and the more interesting question about what can you mix and match? Can you mix and match different cell types from different species? If you put them together in the right way, they may not trigger their respective immune responses or uh, other antagonistic responses. Um, I, I can't speak for the Levin lab. They're the ones that are responsible for the biology, but my understanding is it looks like that will be likely in the not too distant future. Nice, thank you. Yep, thanks for your question. I'm going to jump in with mine again. Um, so um, <clears throat> after self-repair, does the behavior change? Uh, mm. Have you seen that, whether like the, it is it still able to have the same uh, locomotive like forward? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. I don't know. So th these are all videos from Doug, our, our microsurgeon. So I don't know whether, I, I, my understanding is the injuries were actually performed to non-motile xenobots. So those that are just kind of sitting there not doing much. He may have actually observed just by chance some that are motile that move, become damaged and then move again. I'm not sure. Um, I've mostly spoken today about the ones made from myocardiocytes because those can quote unquote walk. Um, we had a paper in Science Robotics last year, um, which was the follow-up paper in which we demonstrated swimming xenobots. So swimming xenobots, uh, so frog tissue, um, cells that are on the outer surface of the organism, they grow very small cilia, these small hairs. We actually have them as well in our lung system to get rid of uh, particulate mat matter. Frogs use it to sort of scrape particulate matter uh, off their body. But if you have a small enough quote unquote frog and enough cilia, they all act like uh, oarsmen and they will row the xenobot forward. Those, I would imagine, they just sort of, they swim. All the cilia will just beat more or less in unison. 
Um, I would imagine if you injure one of those and it heals itself, it will continue swimming. Whether it will continue swimming in the same way, I, I don't know. Um, Doug might know better, but it's a great, great question. And then my final question, I promise, is yeah. that um, have you tried going bigger? So same arc, so same um, same shape, same design, but instead of having like thousand cells, roughly or however that is, uh, going for like a million uh, and making these bigger organisms. Yeah, um, great question. Like I said, at the moment that um, we're limited to about a millimeter in diameter about a several thousand cells, because beyond that, the cells in the middle, they asphyxiate. They don't get any oxygen and they die very quickly. So we can't, we can't get past the millimeter size scale until we are able to design xenobots that can either passively or actively breathe. One possibility though, like I showed you in the swarm, is that they might be able to connect together. So we could do sort of modular bio robotics. That's a possibility. Um, but we haven't really explored. We've seen, you know, examples of that in the dish, but we haven't pursued that systematically yet. But that, that's another possibility to, to scale up in terms of size. Um, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, Jordi. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, perfect. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. I, just a question about um, long-term plans. So right now I had the impression that uh, the way that uh, the robot is, is designed is also um, like the shape is defining its function. Is there a plan to like uh, start introducing some signaling on the, on the, on the Cenobot so that you can control uh, the, the reaction that the, that the Cenobot has? Like for example, um, I mean, the very long term I'm thinking, about having a neural system, but uh, first uh, approximation would be, well, what if we have some electrodes and then we can control how the Xenobot behaves? Yeah, great, great question. So yeah, trying to program Xenobots, that's definitely something that we're working on. Um, introducing neural tissue might be actually a later step. So an earlier step would be, you know, genetic or optogenetic interventions to modulate the sensor motor actions of uh, the Xenobots. Especially in the case of the swimming xenobots with the cilia, uh, with the cilia, um, there's um, you can there are certain ways in which you can intervene to influence how cilia beat under certain circumstances. So we might be able to gain control over the the cellular actuators in the swimming xenobots and move forward from there. You mentioned electrical stimulation as well. It could be could be uh, optical, it could be electrical, it could be chemical. We're, we're looking into it. Um, the fact that cells respond to all of those signals suggests it should be doable in the not too distant future. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much again for this fabulous presentation. Uh, I personally really enjoyed it. And based on the comments, I, I think that the audience also really loved it. And thank you so much for accepting our invite. Hope to uh, see you soon in the future. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks all for your attention. Your great questions. All, all the best to you. Thanks. Bye-bye.